I'll go to my, to my talk, which is about the cornucopia. Cornucopia was, a, in effect, there was a series of articles of Phil Anderson in Physics Today. And uh, in one of them, the title was the spin, glass, the spin Glass Cornucopia. I must confess that on that occasion, I learned what was the translation of cornucopia in, in French. Um, I decided to, to, to give this, this poster uh, on, for, for this talk. Uh, why, why did I do it? Well, it has been mentioned that the day after I, I received the, the prize, or I, was, uh, I, I received the email of Christophe telling me that I would get the prize, just the day after, Giorgio was awarded the Nobel Prize, so it was a good week. Uh, uh, one of these weeks that, uh, that you, you never forget. And, uh, and I found this picture, I like it a lot, I like it a lot because this is Giorgio as I know him, so many times we have been discussing with him in such a situation, the blackboard, and also because he is lecturing, for those who know, it is absolutely clear that he is lecturing on ultrametricity, that is, he is showing this, this ultrametric tree, this um, first, one of the first discovery for me, it was uh, the really the beginning of getting into spin glass theory, um, as Edouard said, I was working on, on particle physics, and at some point I decided to, to switch to, to statistical physics. And uh, I went to see my thesis advisor, Claude, Claude Bouchia. And Claude told me, and he had this reaction absolutely fantastic. I was in the middle of the PhD, after one year and something of the PhD. And Claude told me, you're right. I will go on being your advisor. You will come to see me every second week, and I will see how you progress. And I found that uh, a wonderful attitude. Uh, I was going in a field that was not uh, his field. And much time later, we, we worked together on some aspects of, uh, of statistical physics on, uh, on um, uh, DNA twisting and, and pulling on DNA molecules. So, so this, is, uh, this is Giorgio in the, in the 80s. It started from there. Uh, I have uh, two slides that, uh, that are for my uh, my few friends who are here who are not physicists, and I, I really thank them for coming. Uh, uh, so I decided that I would have a couple of slides to tell you what it is about, and what it is about is, is basically this idea of emergence. Um, to summarize it, if you, if you look at a magnet, the magnet, the magnetism is due to elementary magnetic moment carried by the atoms, and these magnetic moments, they interact and it turns out that in a magnet, they interact in such a way that when the temperature is low enough, they tend to, to point in parallel directions. And when they are all more or less aligned, then you get a, macros a macroscopic magnet. You can measure it, and you can use it for orienting. Uh, it, is, it is a collective state. That is a, it is a state in which you have defects. You have spins. Mag Elementary magnetic moments, which are called spins, which point in opposite direction. They are not the same. They fluctuate. So it's uh, full of fluctuation. But structurally, at the global level, there is this phenomenon of emergence, which shows that uh, it, is, it becomes stable. So um, this is what is observed in a, in a standard magnet. You can measure the magnetization as a function of temperature. There is a critical temperature below which you see the emergence of, of, of the magnet. And in fact, if you take a magnetic needle and you hit it, at some point it will demagnetize when you reach this critical temperature. Technically, the, the rough idea is something that you can get uh, uh, relatively easily, let's say, using, using mean field theory. Mean field theory is a theory in which you take one spin, you look at the influence of all the other neighbors, and, uh, and you write self-consistently what this influence will do to this spin. And you say the other spins, they do the same. So it's a coupled equation, self-consistent. When you solve it, you get a phase diagram like that. This is caricature. It's, it's very, it just gives a rough idea. Actually, uh, physicists have spent a lot of time uh, working on what happens exactly here, where the story is much more complicated, and you need to use uh, what is called the renormalization group. But for what I will tell uh, from now on, which is going to disordered systems, it is really the, the very nature of the low temperature phase, which is already the challenge. Not, uh, I mean, of course, this critical point is always a bigger challenge, but the nature of the phase itself is, is extremely complicated. 
So in the, in the 70s, uh, uh, physicists got interested, some physicists, a few physicists, got interested into uh, some magnetic alloys like uh, uh, copper manganese. When you have a few manganese impurities in copper, it turns out that the manganese carry the spin. They carry the elementary magnetic moment. And, um, but they are located at disordered position. They are not well organized in a crystal. And then depending on the distance between, uh, between the spins, it turns out they, instead of having an interaction that helps them to point parallel, at some distance the interaction is ferromagnetic. It tends to put them in parallel direction. But at other di distances, it, it's anti-ferromagnetic. This is due to the mediation of the copper. There was experimentally studying these alloys have found some strange, uh, uh, strange behavior. Uh, one of them is, is shown here. This is the magnetization that is measured uh, when you take a spin glass uh, as a function of temperature. So when you are between 90 and here 65 uh, Kelvin, you have this is a magnetization in a very small magnetic field. So for physicists, it's the, the linear response regime. So you really measure the susceptibility, and you have a susceptibility which increases, like in a good uh, uh, paramagnet. Then at some point, there is clearly something which has been identified as a, as a, spin, as a spin glass phase transition. And here, if you cool in a small field, you, find you measure this magnetization. But if you, if you cool at zero field here and you put on the field, you will measure that magnetization. The difference between this is called the difference between field cool and zero field cold. It is a measure of the fact that the system does not reach equilibrium. I mean, it's you, you arrive in the end at the same situation. You have the same system with the same temperature and the same field. But depending on the history of preparation, you have two different, uh, uh, completely different magnetization. On top of that, you can show that at, uh, it has been studied quite in detail that uh, at this point there is a divergence of the, of the nonlinear part of the magnetic susceptibility. So this raised the, the interest of a lot of people. And uh, Edwards and Anderson soon came up with a, with a model for that, which was because the, the, the very question was, what is the order? The system seems to order. It has a phase transition. It has a low temperature phase. But what is the nature of this order at low temperature? We know that it is not an order in which the spins align and point in the same direction. What is it? And uh, so Edward Sanderson came up with this simple model in which you have binary spins which point up or down, and an interaction energy which is by interaction by pairs of spins, an energy which depends on the pair. So depending on the on the pair of spin S i S j, depending actually on their distance, the interaction here can be positive or negative. Positive it means it is ferromagnetic; it favors parallel spins, and negative is anti-ferromagnetic. So here comes the, the complication already that you can, that you can see pointing, that uh, each spin in this system will see a completely different environment. It will not have the same couplings with the others. First complication. Second complication has been called frustration. If you take three spins and if you imagine that they have anti-ferromagnetic interaction, the one that tend to put the spins in anti-parallel direction, if one of them points up, this one will point down because it's coupled anti-ferromagnetically at low temperature. But this one is frustrated because it receives a signal from here telling you should be down, and a signal from there saying you should be up. So this is a frustration. And this is a very mechanism by which you create a lot of metastable states, first of all. And secondly, it is extremely difficult to find the, what we call the ground state. What is, it, it looks very simple. It's, you know, it's variable that take values plus or minus one. What is the configuration of the spins that minimizes this function? Just a sum of pair interactions. And uh, this turns out to be an extremely challenging problem. It's a, it's in computer science, it's called the NP-hard problem. And actually, there has been a lot of work, including recently, on the connection between the spin glass theory and, uh, and, uh, and the notion of hardness in computation. Of course, there is the simple algorithm that consists in enumerating all spin configurations and trying to see what which, and seeing which one has the lowest energy. But this one takes an, an enormous time, exponential time. Here we have uh, systems with uh, large sizes, so uh, two to exploring a two to the n uh, a space with two to the n point is absolutely impossible. So I have. Um, 
in, in retrospect at least, I think that there have been really four challenges that have been posed by spin glasses and that addressing these four challenges has, has helped to develop a completely new branch of statistical physics. Uh, the first challenge was the following. You see that uh, if you look at it from the point of view of the of equilibrium probability measure, this is a Boltzmann probability measure, beta is the inverse of the temperature. You see that a sample of copper manganese is given by the position of the manganese. That will determine the, the couplings. And so for each sample, you have a different Hamiltonian. You have a different energy. And characterizing, just to define the energy, I need to give you a very large number of parameters. I should give you, in principle, 10 to the 23 parameters of the order of that, which is insane from the point of view of physics, of course. So immediately, one gets into, into a, a way of thinking in which one will have to think of a distribution of the sample, one, how the sample has been generated. It has been generated by a certain process. You can describe it by a probability law. This induces a probability law on the J, on the, on the couplings. But then, of course, you can ask, but is any sample, do, do they behave the same or not? It, it turns out that a lot of properties uh, are the same whatever the sample. How, how, whatever, if you prepare correctly your copper manganese, will, each time that you prepare it, you will get a different sample, different arrangement of the manganese, but each time you will find the same magnetization, <coughs> the same average energy. There are some subtle differences that, that have been found later. Second point, I mentioned it already, every spin is in a different environment with different magnetizations, so you cannot do this, what I, I often call it the theory of the representative agent. That's the mean field theory in other fields. In economics, it's well known as the theory of the representative agent. You take a representative spin influenced by the other, but all the others behave the same, so it is a representative agent. Here, no. Here, each spin has, is different. And so you get the description of the, of, the, of the order, which is a spontaneous magnetization, is, is one in which you need to solve coupled equations for this n magnetization, one for each of the spins. So this, this is extremely complicated. These are the famous uh, Thaules, Anderson, uh, Palmer uh, equations. Um, it tells us also that uh, the, the order is extremely subtle. That is, uh, the, the spins tend to freeze in some directions, but this direction you cannot say a priori where, where it will be. The third challenge is that actually the energy landscape is extremely complicated. It has, uh, it has many uh, minima, and so the, the low-lying state, the low energy state, uh, this is a one-dimensional sketch of uh, what happened in very large dimension, of course, but the low-lying state, there are, there are many of them, actually there are uh, exponentially many of them if you put a small, a small window. And so it is completely different from what happens in a ferromagnet. In a ferromagnet, you have two states. Here, you have many states. So not only the order is random, but there are many possible ways of ordering. So that was the third challenge. Uh, a technical remark. So if you want to identify the order, you, there is a notion of symmetry breaking, a spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's well known in ferromagnets. In ferromagnets, you know that if you want to define the magnetization, you put the system in a very small magnetic field, compute the magnetization, and let the magnetic field go to zero. And if it goes to zero by positive value, you, take, you have the system polarized up. If it is, goes to zero with negative values, you have the system magnetized down. In a spin glass, it is nearly the same, but with a small detail, that you need a magnetic field well chosen and different on each side. So you don't know that a priori. If you know that, you know what will be the order. So it is, it is, it is uh, the, the question is, is bootstrapping. And, uh, and so it is, it is an extremely complicated problem. And uh, in some sense, this is one of the way to understand uh, why replicas have been successful. Uh, uh, Edouard was mentioning, uh, was mentioning replicas. It was, uh, it was magics. Uh, it still is, actually, that is uh, quite uh, remarkable that after all these, uh, 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 how many, uh, nearly, yeah, four decades now, uh, it is still magic and, not, uh, and still not justified. But physically, I think it makes kind of sense if you think that 
if you want to really identify what is this local magnetization that, that will, um, sp the, the local field that will help to polarize uh, in, a, in a good direction, well, you don't know it. You have no way to, to knowing it. It's extremely complicated, but the system knows it. And so if the system knows it, you, what you can do is take one copy of the system, one replica of the system, and use it as a magnetic field for the other copy and reciprocally. And so you have these two coupled systems, and then you can see, do they align or do they not align? You put a small coupling between them, and when you relax the coupling between them, do they keep aligned or not? And that will be the order parameter uh, of, uh, of spin glasses, which is this uh, very well-known uh, distribution, uh, distribution of overlap, the overlap being just the, the coupling between the, between the spin configuration. And the final fourth big challenge that had to be uh, addressed for creating this new uh, version, this new branch of statistical physics, was uh, out of equilibrium dynamics, uh, which is very relevant experimentally. One sees uh, slow relaxation is ubiquitous. There are aging phenomena. Um, Non-equilibrium effects are crucial. I will not uh, address them in the following. So um, this has created a, a, lot, a, a lot of activity. It has been, it has been called a, a cornucopia. And actually, this idea of cornucopia, or at least the idea that the developments for this system could have applications in very different fields, came very soon. It came very soon for, uh, it is actually, uh, it's written here in the, the book that we wrote in 1987 with, uh, with uh, Giorgio and, uh, and, uh, and Miguel, Miguel Irazoro, uh, was called Spin Glass Theory and Beyond. And the Beyond was the, what we could see at that time of the cornucopia. We, did, we had a very preliminary version of the cornucopia. It has expanded a lot since then. But it was based, uh, there were two major, major um, uh, developments that had taken place around 83. One of them was the paper by Kirkpatrick, Gelat, and Vecchi about using simulated annealing, a typical method of statistical physics, numerical method for sampling the Gibbs measure. Uh, use it for optimization. Use it for solving a traveling salesman problem and so on and so forth. So this made the contact with optimization. The second paper was Hopfield, John Hopfield paper in which he was using a spin glass model carefully coined uh, as, as, um, as a way to, to create a model of an associative memory, completely different from what was used uh, usually in the computers. And so here I, I, have, I have taken the, the, a few words of the introduction of the, of the book, of the beyond, as it is called uh, often. And, uh, and uh, you see, we, are, we were at that time already firmly convinced that the techniques developed for spin glasses, replica, tap, cavity, can be applied to a myriad of other problems that otherwise are very difficult to handle. We think that the moment is ripe to try a presentation of these techniques that demonstrates their essential simplicity. Maybe the final word here was a bit exaggerated from some of the people who tried to, to study in this book, but at least we tried, let's say. Uh, so this is a very short version of the cornucopia. I will not enumerate it. It's, uh, it goes from problems of uh, physics, uh, mathematics, constraint satisfaction problem, economy and finance, evolution, heteropolymers, and here uh, neural network theory, inference statistics, information theory, and, uh, and the constraint satisfaction problem. And uh, I remember discussing this with, uh, with Jean-Philippe Bouchot a few years ago. I think it was in, uh, in um, 2018. And Jean-Philippe told me, and it is only the beginning. So be ready. Um, I, will, I will talk briefly about uh, this, uh, this part of it, which is more about uh, inference. Uh, and, uh, and I will start by uh, asking, by defining what, what we mean by inference. Inference takes actually the various meanings in, in different fields. But basically in statistics, inference problem is where you want to infer a hidden rule or hidden parameters from data. So if you look at Bayesian inference, you have, you have a rule, you have unknown parameters. For instance, you want to fit a distribution here saying maybe this could be a Gaussian with a, 
uh, uh, mean and, uh, and the matrix of, uh, of co covariance matrix. So you have these, uh, these uh, two parameters for the mean and, uh, and three for the, for the covariance. And how do I get them? Well, you can set up a Bayesian approach in which the probability of the parameter given the data is proportional to the probability of the data given the parameters time a prior. So maybe here in this case, you would say, well, the prior is that the mean should be uh, somewhere here in this square, let's say, and um, some um, prior on the, on the variance that it could not be too large or things like that. And the challenge is to find the parameter. So this is the basics of statistics in some sense. And if you look at systems in which you have small numbers of parameters, it is really uh, many books and lectures and, and, and beautiful results on that. The challenge, the new challenge, which becomes more and more and more relevant, is to address questions of inference in which you are in a very large dimensional space. This is what happens in particular in machine learning, in which you will want to fit data with an extremely large number of parameters. And then if you have, uh, if the dimension of X, uh, if X is uh, one million parameters, well, you get into something which starts to look a lot like statistical physics, in which you have a coupled uh, uh, probability distribution for a large number of variables, parameterized by disorder. And the disorder which is here is the data, is, is the experimental data that you have obtained. I will give uh, maybe, um, I had prepared, okay, I will give two examples. I will start with a, a first example on communication and error correction. Uh, this was uh, recognized to be a problem very well connected to spin glasses. Uh, actually, one of the first pe persons who recognized that is Nicola Sorlas, who is here. And um, the idea of error correction is the following. You, you basically, as soon as you communicate something, uh, whether you do a phone call or you write something on your hard disk or when I talk to you, in, me, in all these cases, we use error correcting codes. I, maybe you never realize that I'm using an error correcting code when I talk to you, but I do. I do because I'm using English. English is an extremely redundant language. So if I don't pronounce very well, or maybe if I have a French accent, in principle, if, if English was a perfect language, and I have language, you know, it not, does not make sense. You have understood language, but okay. Uh, if I mispronounce, you, you correct it. You correct it because there is a, a single word which is close to language, uh, and you identify it. So this redundancy is exploited for, 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 for error correction. So in general, in the, in the setting that was developed by, by Claude Shannon. Ah, here it is. You have an initial message, you will code it, you will send it through a noisy channel. And uh, so the initial message is what I would like to tell to you. I have it in my head. The coding is I use English, then I send it through the channel, and uh, you receive it, you decode, and you have it in your head. Does it look the same as the, what, uh, what I wanted to tell you? doesn't work so easily when you think about it, but that's another, that's another question. In, in, technically, when you want to do it, the simplest code that you can imagine is I want to send this image here, and I send it three times. So I receive three times. Each time it is blurred by noise. Here it's a 10% noise. And then I have a very simple decoding. I take every pixel. I take the top left pixel here. This one is black. This one is white. This one is black. So I put a black. And I decoded by majority rule. And you see that, indeed, I have decreased the noise. So this is the simplest possible uh, code. Much more powerful codes are, are using multi-bit interaction, are using parity checks. So for instance, you will, you will agree between the sender and the receiver that you send, you use messages which are from a book. It's called the code book. And they can use only messages from this code book. And they will make it such that if I send a message from the code book, I know that in my code book there are no other messages which are close to it. So that I will, if it is slightly distorted, I will be able to find which one was the, the message of the code book that you had sent me. Okay. So here is one possibility of building a code book. It is by saying I will use messages that satisfy a set of linear equations. 
let's say the, the sum of the four bits x1 plus x4 plus x5 plus x7 is even. It is 0 mod 2. I have the second equation, third equation. Here I have seven bits. I have three linear equations between them. And because of that, I have four independent bits. I have two to the four code words. My code book contains two to the four words. And if I send, for instance, the code word 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, which satisfies all my three equations, and if I receive this, well, then you will see that uh, I can ask, I will do a Bayesian computation, I will say, what is, what is the probability that the message that was sent was 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0? Well, this happens if there has been just one spin flip, one flip. So this happens if the flipping probability is p, it happens with probability p. Here, on the contrary, if I, I could say also, I could have sent uh, 1101000 and the channel, because this satisfies all the equations, but the channel has flipped these two guys. But this happens with probability p square. So the most probable one, if p is small, is this one. That's how I correct errors. So this is very elementary, very simple. Now, of course, the efficient codes, they are, on, they are based on that. But in a case in which you have a large number of variables, a large number of equations, and uh, you want to infer uh, what is the message that was sent. And in practice, people use um, systems in which they have maybe thousands of, speed, of, of, of bits that they send together. So you have this big problem in which you receive 1,000 bits. You don't know which one have been flipped. But using the parity check equations, you should be able to decode. And uh, so this turns, to be, this turns out to be a statistical physics problem. This is the probability that the, the word x1, xn has been sent, given that I receive y1, yn. It is a product of two factors. This factor is just a complicated way to say x was in my code book. It was satisfying a number of equations. And this one tells me each bit can be flipped by the channel. And, uh, This turns out to be a spin glass problem with multi-spin interaction, and the performance is limited by, by, a, by a glass transition. One possible decoding algorithm is to use mean field belief propagation equations and to solve them iteratively. If you, that is the algorithmic part, which interests a lot, of course, the people who are designing codes. They want to know, the, the, they want to use the best possible algorithm. One thing which is interesting that you can get from the statistical physics analysis, actually from the cavity method that allows you to, to solve that, is to analyze what is the performance of such a code when you take it in the large size limit. In large system limit, what you can show is that as a function of the noise level, the noise level P, which was a probability of flipping a bit, you have the red curve which tells you if you have the perfect decoding, that is if you, if you find, uh, if, you are, if you have a perfect algorithm, then up to this, to this level, this critical level of noise, you will decode perfectly, and then you will not decode. But then algorithmically, you find that the, the mean field equations, be belief propagation equations uh, algorithm has another transition which is below, and that is the algorithmic transition. It is limited by a glass transition, by a proliferation of metastable states. So this is an example of a phase diagram. And actually, phase diagrams, they are, they are encountered, they are ubiquitous in information theory. They are ubiquitous in, in computer science by now. So it is really one, one of, the, of the terms and the concept that has been, uh, that has been used uh, everywhere. So uh, this is, a, if I go back to the landscape, uh, if I have in the low noise regime, I have a kind of easy landscape and I will find uh, the, the configuration which satisfies all the equations and there is only one, it's easy. There is a high uh, noise regime in which there actually are many possible solutions and I don't know which one to choose. And there is this intermediate one in which there is one, but it is hidden because there is a proliferation of glass state that traps the diameters. I will, I will not go through the second example because I am kind of late, but I will, I will tell you a little bit about, about one tool which is the development of mean field equations for, for these kind of systems. 
and uh, uh, it is in some sense the generalization of the of the very simple mean field of, uh, of vice. Uh, it has created a whole field where you you have creation of algorithms with pretty names, uh, acronyms, etc. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, a tool, an analytic tool, to control the behavior of this algorithm using the cavity method. So just a, a small, very uh, two minutes of, uh, of, uh, of uh, computation in some sense. Imagine that I have a probability distribution of five vari variables. It is here. It is written as a product of factors. There is a factor A, which has a certain, uh, certain probability weight depending on the variable x1, x2, and x4. B has a probability weight for variable x2 and x3, etc., etc. So each square is a factor. Each uh, circle is a variable. This is a, comp a relatively complicated uh, probability distribution. Imagine that you have it with one million variable instead of five, and then you, you will agree that it is complicated. And this diagram, which is called the factor graph, tells you what is the dependence of, uh, of basically the, the, the basic correlations between the variables, even if the correlations can then propagate on this graph. So uh, the, the idea of the mean field, which is the development of mean field, in some sense, you can, you can connect it kind of remotely to what Beto and Piles did for improving the standard mean field theory. Uh, basically, you will say there, are, there is a first type of message, which is what is the probability of x1 in the absence of the, of the factor a? I call it a message that is sent from 1 to a. And then I have a, certain, a second type of message, which is I take one variable, I erase all the factors but one. Here I have kept only c. And I look at what is the probability of x1 when it is connected only to c. And this is a message that is sent from c to 1 of x1. And you can write coupled equations that, you will, that, you, that will tell you the probability of one in the absence of C, it is the product of the influence of each factors incoming here. And the probability of two when it is connected only to C, uh, here you have to do some computation. You have to look at the probability of one in the absence of C, the probability of three in the absence of C times a factor. I, I go very fast, but believe, believe me, it is possible to write that. It's a closed set of equations. There are two messages going on the graph. Uh, on each edge, one in each direction, and you have exactly the same number of equations as unknown for these messages. This is uh, the celebrated belief propagation. When is it exact? It handles correctly fluctuations, but one has to be careful. It may break down when there are subtle correlations. In particular, here I cheated in the, in the derivation that I, was, that I was doing. I was doing it so fast that you could not see my, my, that I was cheating, but uh, uh, in, if, if there is, for instance, an, uh, another variable which uh, belongs to D and to A, then there is a correlation here. And this correlation is, is not handled correctly. So it becomes exact on a tree. It becomes exact on locally tree-like graphs, like the one that are used in error correcting codes. And it's exact in infinite range problems. Now, we, in, in spin glass physics, we had, a, we had our second challenge that we had to to handle with, for this problem here. Uh, the second challenge was that actually, in a lot of problems that we are interested in, there are many possible ordering, there are many possible ground states of the system. It turns out that for each of them, there is a, a different solution of the belief propagation equation. These mean field equation, they have many solutions. And so what do you do when you have that? It's extremely, it becomes extremely complicated. First of all, it signals the fact that the, the, the Simple iteration of the equation do not converge. And that is when we had this idea with, uh, with uh, Giorgio and uh, Riccardo Zecchina to look, well, when there are many solutions, what we will do is we will, we will go to a meta description of the problem in which we would like to understand what is the probability if I take an edge of the factor graph at random, what is the probability that when I take uh, one state at random, what will be the message? What is the probability of the message? And then you can write coupled equation for this complicated object, which is a probability of a probability. The message itself was a probability, and you take a probability of a probability in another ensemble. This is called survey propagation. 
and, uh, and this has had quite a lot of, uh, of uh, developments and, uh, and applications. So these are, these are fast methods which have, uh, which have uh, shown uh, uh, quite uh, interesting performances. They also solve very complicated global problems by simple update rules locally. Uh, and, and this is a contact with the neural network that has maybe not been exploited so much. I will, I will uh, finish with my, my third example of inference, which is machine learning. So as you know, by now, there are a lot of people working on identifying cats and dogs on images of the internet. So you have uh, the following challenge. I have, a, I have a lot of images of cats, a lot of images of dogs. I know which one are cats, which one are dogs, because some people are working hard for doing that. One must say that also. And I have a machine. It has a lot of parameters. And I would like to have a machine that is able to identify a cat and a dog. This was a big challenge. Our colleagues uh, doing uh, image analysis were not able to do it by hand, to, that is by hand, by creating an algorithm, inventing an algorithm. But, uh, but machine learning is, is the following idea. You take actually a neural network in which each unit here is an artificial neuron. The artificial neuron does something very simple. It takes the input for the from the neurons on the left to which it is connected, and it has some weights. So weighted inputs and a nonlinearity that is inspired from uh, the behavior of a neuron, which receives some synaptic input modulated by the synaptic efficacy and having a nonlinearity at the, at the level of the soma. So you have this thing, and for each edge of this graph, you have a parameter. You have one of these weights. And now the challenge is, can you find all these weights so that your, your network here will be able to say this is a cat, and you, when you present a dog, it is a dog. This is a very big challenge. It is a challenge because you have systems which are very large. You can have millions of neurons, hundreds of layers, tens of, thousands, tens of millions of parameters. So you want to optimize something in a 10 million dimensional space. Actually, you want to fit something in a 10 million, with 10 million parameters. So if you, you remember von Neumann, he told you with five parameters, you should never do it. Even four is, is too much. Here, we do it with 10 million. So it's crazy. It's crazy, but it works. Uh, it works because it is trained on very large database. So this is one of the, of the main progress, is the fact that we have many, many images labeled, accessible. And, and the second progress is that there is a computing power, of course. So uh, basically, this is again a problem of statistical physics of disordered systems. You have a, a set of inputs, database, that is an input, that would be an image. The output would be the label of the image, cat or, cat or dog. You have a large set of parameters called collectively W. These neural networks implement a function Y equal F of the parameter and the input, that is the output. And then what you have is a database. And the database is a series of images and labels. And then, basically, we would like to find the W that fits the database. You do, in the simplest case, you will do least square, uh, least square fit. Because you want to find the W that minimizes that. Then, of course, the big challenge would be to say, not only do you, are you able to do it, and secondly, does it generalize well when you present a new cat that the system has never seen? Uh, you can formulate it in terms of Bayesian inference, and you get, again, a probability distribution of, uh, uh, of a spin glass type, let's say, in which the data, the database, plays the role of the, of the disorder. Uh, a priori, when you look at it, you would guess that the energy landscape is very complicated. It should be a spin glass landscape. It has all the, all the aspects. It has many variables. It has a disorder. It has all kinds of frustration. It turns out that, and that is largely seen mostly experimentally, that if you have a network that, that becomes deep enough, that's why people are talking of deep enough, you add layers and layers and layers, it seems that this landscape is not that complicated and that simple methods for learning are able to find a solution. These, uh, these pink points here would be in the parameter space, in the space of W, would be solutions that are able to fit uh, the database. And you find them by gradient descent. So it means that the landscape is not that complicated. It has flat minima, there is a question of entropy. This has created a lot of, a lot of activity 
in the in the recent years i will not uh, i will not survey survey it but the, the these networks basically they work in a very strongly over parameterized regime it makes learning easier it should degrade generalization but still experimentally it works well this is a very interesting interesting challenge there are many ideas about that and and general methods of statistical physics of these ordered systems uh, it has all the four ingredients that I was mentioning, the four challenges uh, are, are, can, can be brought to bear on this, on this problem. One building block of this of these machine learning, of these neural networks, is what is called the perceptron. It's one, if you look at one neuron and the input from all the other ones, let's say, then in the simplest case, for instance, the nonlinearity could be a sine function, and you see that you have n inputs, n weights, a vector of weights, a vector of inputs, and y is the sign of the weight dot the input. And so basically, you will have a, a vector of weights, and you will have a linear separator, which will separate the data between uh, the, the, the one which are on the, size of, on the side of this hyperplane, where w points, and the other ones. If you, one, one aspect, because I like it, even if it is uh, somewhat old, but it gives an idea of what can be done and what is being generalized nowadays in, in more complicated uh, systems, you can, you can look at what happens in a teacher-student setup. The teacher-student is to say, there is, a, there is a teacher. The teacher has its weight W tilde. That's the weight of the teacher. Of the teacher. So the teacher, you will present some data, and the teacher will tell you, for each vector of data that you present, it will tell you, that is the desired output. It has its hyperplane. It, he, the teacher knows where is the hyperplane. And the student will try to learn what is, what is its weight. And ideally, it should converge to the same weight as the, as the teacher. If it does that, then it means that he has learned the rule. Uh, uh, this can be express, expressed, in, uh, uh, again, in a statistical mechanics language. In particular, this was done by by Elizabeth Gardner and then Gardner and Derrida and many people have been working on that. It's a statistical mechanics in the space of these weights, of these parameters. Again, in which the, the, the database is the quenched disorder. And you can analyze that in the thermodynamic limit. And what you will find is the following. You find that this is a generalization error. That is, what, what will the, the student, uh, what will be the mistake, the probability that the, the student makes a mistake if you present a new pattern. That is, you present a new data. The teacher tells you that should be the desired output. And the student says, this is what I find. Of course, it depends on the distance between the weight of the teacher and the student. If they align, then the, the generalization is perfect. And what you find is that as function of the size of the database, there is a phase transition. If you look at the, at the green and at this curve here, the top one, uh, there is this phase transition at a certain value near to 1.5. Uh, 1.5 is the ratio between the size of the database and the number of weights that you have to optimize. At 1.5, there is a sudden phase transition, first order, and the student generalizes perfectly. That is a binary case. That's the case in which the weights have binary entries. But if you look at the algorithms that are able to do that, if you look at the bias optimal algorithm using belief propagation and so on, they stop here. That is already at 1.25. Then uh, you 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 are you are, you are stuck. So basically, sorry, I have missed it. It's the contrary. This is a this is a absolute phase transition. This is the algorithmic phase transition. So if you do not have enough data, generalization is impossible. If you have a lot of data, generalization is easy. And there is an intermediate phase in which generalization is in principle possible. You have enough information from the information theoretic point of view. Shannon told you it should be doable, but you don't have the algorithm to do it efficiently. So I think that um, this, this is just to get an idea of what can, what can be done. I, I want to emphasize that I, I think that this whole story of machine learning is a, it's a strong activity at the moment. As we all know, in the last 10 years, there has been a, an incredible technological breakthrough. 
uh, with methods, with people are able to solve problems that, that we could not imagine could be possible to solve. It can actually help a lot to do science, to analyze data, to predict activity of molecules, predict folding of proteins, predict a lot of things. But the understanding is not that great. And it is, and I think I'm convinced that the question of understanding this is a basic question of statistical physics. It's a case in which when you have learned, when you have taken one of these big, big networks that is able to analyze what is a cat and what is a dog, you know everything. You know the value of each of the 110 million parameters that you have in your, in your system. You know each of them, but you don't understand how it does. So it is really a problem of emergence, emergence in a disordered case. Uh, there are many challenges around that, understanding better the role of architecture, the different uh, roles of different algorithms. And one of them on which I have been, I just wanted to mention it to conclude because I have been working on that in the last few years, is the question of data structure. In a lot of what physicists had been doing, the data had been, you have to take an ensemble of data. Like I was telling you at the beginning, you have an ensemble of spin glass. You have to say what is the statistical distribution of the position of the manganese. Here you have an ensemble of data. Very often physicists have taken ensemble of data which was just IID, identically distributed. That is, each bit has the same probability distribution and they are uncoupled. This is totally unrealistic. I mean, the, the practical way of using uh, the deep networks is using it on very structured data. For instance, if I look at one of the simplest problems, now considered as very simple, which is uh, 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 um, uh, analyzing uh, uh, handwritten digits. Uh, here, the handwritten digits, they are, they are um, just pixel on the 28 by 28 squares, black and white pixel. So it is a vector in 784 dimensions. It can be gray or, 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 or black and white. And so you have this 784 dimensional space, which is the space of your inputs. But it turns out that you will present to this, to this system, the database will be handwritten digits. And handwritten digits, they are not an arbitrary black and white uh, 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 pattern of 28 by 28. They are structured. And actually, by using some methods that had been described by Grasberger and Prokashia initially uh, to, to find the, the dimension of strange attractors, you can look at what is the typical nearest neighbor distance between two of the handwritten digits of the database, how it scales with the size of the database. And it scales with a power which gives you the dimension of the manifold in which these digits live. And when you do that, you find that uh, in your 784 dimensional space, the handwritten digits more or less they live in a manifold which is of dimension 15. It's much, much more simple. Fortunately, you don't know this manifold. It's not a linear manifold. That would be a linear algebra that would be great. That would be so easy. It's a very folded, convoluted manifold and so on. So the geometrically, the problem of, of analyzing handwritten digit, you can, you can look at the manifold of the nines. The manifold of the nine, I don't remember now. It has dimension eight or something like that. Dimension of the five, it has dimension 12. Dimension of the ones, it has the low dimension, six, seven. And in this 15-dimensional manifold, you have 10 sub-manifolds you want to identify in which you fall. Seen like that, it seems simple, except that you don't know where is, where is the folding. So one of the big challenges, I think, in order to have really the statistical physics bringing new ideas for, for machine learning, one of the big challenges is, is to develop tools of statistical physics which are able to handle structured disorder. Structured disorder here means structured data, means data which, has, which lives in a low dimensional space in some sense, which is the data that you want to analyze. If you want to analyze protein folding, you are not analyzing uh, anything. It's, it lives in a relatively low dimensional space. So um, I, I just uh, wanted to end with that because it's one of the, of the problems on which we are working at the moment with some colleagues. I have touched very, very superficially these uh, three points of the, of the cornucopia. There are many more. And one thing that I wanted to, to end with that I mentioned in my abstract is uh, this sentence again of, physic of, of Phil Anderson, again in this series of, uh, 
of uh, articles in physics today, uh, he, he refers to the fact that really initially, spin glass was a very obscure thing. It was, you know, a small magnetic anomaly in some alloys. And these alloys, I should tell you, nobody has been able to make something out of it. There is no device which is based on spin glasses. There is no grant on spin glasses. It might explain, actually, that there has been more, much more work done on spin glasses in, in Europe than in, than in the US. People who have been working on spin glasses, they got grants on something else. And they were doing the spin glass theory on the side. So it was really purely intellectual interest. People got into that because, because it is fascinating, because it has all this structure, this ultrametric structure to start with, and, and all the rest that I have mentioned. And so uh, uh, Phil Anderson uh, explains how it is the best example I know of the dictum that a real scientific mystery is worth pursuing to the ends of the earth for its own sake. And I think it's a very good, a very good lesson. Thanks a lot. <laughs>